There'll be no more kneeling, no more bowing, no more kneeling after a while, no more weeping, no more crying, no more weeping after a while, and before. I'll be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave And go home to be my Lord And to go home to be with my Lord And be free I should say a few words before we proceed to the first panel. This particular topic is, one of the, is perhaps one of the most taboo topics in American society. You know, we have rallies against rape, we have rallies against war, though not enough of those. We discuss incest, drug abuse, child abuse, spousal abuse, genocide, especially genocide across the waters. We know all about Anne Frank, but we know nothing about our Anne Franks, such as Linda Brent, for example, who uh, spent eight years, but perhaps it was nine, in concealment in a house, in the attic of a house, in the garret of her grandmother's house, I think. Cut off from her children, for the most part, who thought she had gone north. And uh, Linda Brent eventually escaped to the north and lived in freedom. This is all in the incidents in the life of uh, Linda Brent. The exact title escapes me right now. But uh, in this particular part of U.S. history and American history, you'll find some of the most powerful narratives that you will ever encounter. Narratives that are compelling and stunning. And basically, that's the way it is if you look at slavery in American history, the power of this institution is like a knockout. And it dispels all notions that we have of liberty and democracy and freedom. Slavery is the real story, not of the United States, but of the Americas. Now, our first panel is going to look at a region that's very distant for many people living in Southern California, the Caribbean. And someone might easily ask, well, you know, it's not mandated by the California State Legislature. Why, why do you go to such distant places to start? Well, one of the things we've learned is that you can't understand slavery in the United States without seeing it within the context of the Americas and perhaps other contexts as well. You know, I'm always amused when I ask my students, what nation is south of the United States? And I time the pause as they wonder, is this a trick question? <laughs> After a while, they come up with Baja, which I tell them is close. <laughs> then they have to think some more because you know we have a very national we have a very narrow approach to american history i'm always embarrassed at my colleagues in particular who speak of american history when they mean the united states appropriating that term which really applies to two continents and many nations for one nation i'm always amazed at how not only the press and the government officials 
and the school teachers do that, but professional historians as well. And you know, that's only done in the United States. When you go to Europe and you say you're from America, they'll say, which country? But I always marvel at how the wrong things get fixed in our minds and the curriculum, and they just stay there. And that's the way it is about slavery. Most of the things people know about US slavery is very little, and what they do know is usually wrong. And it's as simple as that. They know very little, what they do know is usually wrong. So our first panel will deal with slavery in a larger context than we usually assume, showing the links between the other Americas and our America. The moderator will be the chair of Black Studies and Women's Studies, Jacqueline Bobo. The commentator will be Robert Hill from UCLA. And now I'm going to turn it over to those two. I know they're out there, but as I said, we are shorthand. You know. Could we get one more glass of water, please? <laughs> ah, there it is. It just appeared. That's very good. Oh, yeah. Hello, everybody, and welcome. Uh, this is a absolutely wonderful occasion, and it's come together, I think, just absolutely uh, stupendously. And I want to thank the chancellor and the dean and um, the new chancellor at UC Riverside for coming out and for, and I also want to acknowledge the, the chancellor's wife, Deling Yang, for coming. <laughs> thank you. Um, my name is Jacqueline Bobo. I'm chair of the Department of Black Studies, and I'm going to introduce the panelists for you today, Slavery and Freedom in the Caribbean and Latin America. Patrick Belgard smith is... Um, uh, a renowned scholar, a Haitian scholar, and also a, a, an absolutely wonderful um, ally, compatriot, and very good friend. And I, I think it's absolutely wonderful in my life that I've gotten to know him through Claudine Michelle and Douglas Daniels. Patrick Belgard Smith is professor of Africology at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. He has written a number of articles as well as books on Haiti and international politics, among which are in the Shadow of Powers, Dante's Bellegarde and Haitian Social Thought, which came out in 1985, Haiti, The Breached Citadel, which came out in 1990, and he has an edited book. Um, I think it's called the, he'll correct me on this if I'm wrong, The Spirit, The Myth, The Reality, Voodoo and Haitian Development, okay, which is forthcoming. His paper is titled, The Fire This Time, Global Implications of the Haitian Revolution, 1791-1806. I'm going to introduce a person who's not here because she, I remember when uh, Professor Daniels uh, asked her to come to the conference and she was very excited to, to do the conference. This is Patricia Penn Hilden. Hilden. Okay, <laughs> and I know that there were some family difficulties, so I know that she did indeed want to be here. Uh, so um, I've been given, I've, I've been asked to also tell you just a little about who she is, even though she's not here. I think her spirit resonates with us here. Patricia Penn Hilden uh, is a descendant of the Wallawa Ness Pierce Band, is a professor of Native American Studies and Comparative Ethnic Studies in the Department of Ethnic Studies at UC Berkeley. After a decade working in the Educational Opportunity Program, she returned to graduate school and earned a PhD in history at Cambridge University, where she taught before returning to the United States. She came to the University of California in 1995. She has published three 
books most recently when Nichols were Indians, published by the Smithsonian Institution in 1995. She has one book from the Red Zone, Critical Perspectives on Race, um, which is now in the consideration at Stanford University Press. She is, um, <clears throat> because she could not be with us today, Professor Inez Telemontes from Re Religious Studies and Chicano Studies here at UC Santa Barbara is not a substitute, but a <laughs> an absolutely wonderful uh, participant. And we're grateful for her for coming in and doing the presentation. Uh, and I think you're reading Professor Hild Hilden's yes, paper, correct. okay, which is uh, titled "Hunting North American Ind Indians in Barbados." Um, the next participant is Andrew Fisher, who will complete his dissertation and re receive a PhD in history at UC San Diego next month. He has been the recipient of numerous fellowships, including the UC President Dissertation Year Fellowship, and at next academic year, he will hold a UC President's Postdoctoral Fellowship has, at, UC, at UCLA. His paper is titled, Beyond Slavery, Afro-Mestizos, Indians, and Identity in Colonial Western Mexico. <coughs> The commentator for uh, today's panel is um, Professor Bobby Heal, who's professor of history at UCLA. He is literary executor of the CLR James Papers and directors of, director of the Marcus Garvey Project at UCLA. So I present the panel to you today. Thank you, Dr. Bobo, for this wonderful introduction. I think I blushed, and you may not have seen it. Um, I take the title of the conference with the utmost seriousness, Legacy of Slavery, Unequal Exchange. Every word, I'm sure, was very carefully chosen, and I will address my remarks in the form of conclusions in a paper that still remains to be written to that title. These are thoughts, reflections of a Haitian historian over the past over several decades. And this has been my interest, among other things. The, I, I want to also mention that in less than two years, on January 1st, 2004, Haiti will celebrate its bicentennial. And I hope that many things will happen not just in Haiti, but in the Caribbean, in Latin America, in Europe, and in North America to celebrate that event, which was the most mocking event, especially in terms of people of African descent over long periods of time. The title, The Fire Next Time, Global Implications of the Haitian Revolution, 1791-1804-1806, I think is self-explanatory, but I will have to, something to say about it in a moment. The events that transpired in Saint-Domingue in mid-18th century until early 19th century were momentous. Never before in the West had Africans occupied the world stage as protagonists. Yet, two centuries later, and over the course of time, in most all textbooks, the Haitian struggles are forced to occupy the shadows and the back of the stage, denied their objective preeminence as a world revolution where few revolutions ever take root. At the end of its cycle, the Haitian revolution will be the victim of its own success, of the terror it elicited in the minds of white people and helping to bring by its presence the genesis of scientific racialism as it erupted in Western Europe and North America. But the revolution had run its course. The victim of the world system as defined then as now, but also of its own timid westernizing elites unable to break economically and psychologically with the colonial past. Haiti itself would be victimized just for daring to challenge the status quo of the old world order. Two centuries later, 
it finds itself again battling the new world order of George Bush the father and globalization of George Bush the son, the West's response to the world's struggles against neo-colonialism. We face the permanence of a centuries-old struggle between maintaining power and the quest for freedom. These are antithetical concepts anchored in our daily realities. Aimé Césaire has written that in Haiti, la négritude s'est mise debout pour la première fois, that for the first time, Africans had challenged their ascribed status and won. In hindsight, though perceived as cataclysmic in the West, the Haitian Revolution had not changed the world, the result of ongoing history. To the contrary, it strengthened the resolve of the powerful to remain in power by whatever means necessary. That signal event at the end of the 18th century, soon after the French Revolution of 1789, to which it is simultaneously related and not related, remains the first real revolution in the Americas, North or South, overshadowing the American movement for political independence in 1776. But as with the earlier situation, again in hindsight, the American movement became perceived as more significant than it really was because of United States power in the intervening years. The victors write history. The French Empire was mortally wounded by the loss of Saint-Domingue. Forty percent of the value of the French trade was with that colony. France controlled 40 percent of the sugar market worldwide, and about 20% of its population was tied in one way or another to its colony, Saint-Domingue. France's defeat led to the fire sale of the Louisiana Territory to the United States for paltry sum. With the Haitian Revolution, the forces of good were defeated by the forces of evil. Black armies had prevailed. Civilization was under attack in the 1790s, and the civilized world was to respond in self-defense. I said 1790s, not 1990s. The United States, for the first time, perhaps felt fear, not because the Haitian Navy was poised to attack, but because of the demonstrative effect of the Haitian Revolution seen as repl replicable elsewhere. France had artfully fanned these fears when its minister, Charles Talleyrand, addressed a letter to Secretary of State James Madison in July 1805, quote, the existence of a black people in arms, occupying a country it has soiled by the most criminal acts, is a most horrible spectacle, spectacle, spectacle for all white nations. These must understand that in accepting the continuation of the state of affairs, they will be supporting pyromaniacs and assassins. The, there is no valid reason that holds for individuals, citizens of a loyal and generous government, to grant support to these brigands who have declared themselves the enemies of all governments." End quote. The argument was essentially that there is no middle ground. You are with us or you are against us. That is what the French government said to the United States. The fire next time of my title borrows language from James Baldwin about the civil rights and black liberation movements that in turn borrowed it from African American ideological and religious discourse. God gave Noah the rainbow sign. No more water, the fire next time. As with today's electronic transfers of vast financial assets across the world, water had been the superhighway upon which 12 or 15 million Africans had traversed one world into another, into the surreal conditions extant in the Americas. Those who survived built a new world new cultures from old, required to create wealth for Europeans while remaining pariahs in the land of their rebirth. 
in the European world they inhabited, mercantilism and protectionism, capital formation and later industrialization were of necessity anchored in a racialized labor force in which Spain and Portugal, then England and France, vied for wealth and world supremacy. These historical processes were the direct and necessary antecedents for today's wealth and present day struggles worldwide, the foundation upon which economic, financial, and political power rests. The development of national economies in Western Europe and North America rested on the emergence of an orderly international system from structures and institutions created for the purpose of wealth creation. Biblical water being out of question, fire remained a viable option. It was reported that slaves inflamed by their sorry conditions set Saint Domingue ablaze and that these fires were seen hundreds of miles at sea. The Martinican philosopher Franz Fanon had argued for the cleansing effect of violence responding to earlier forms of colonial violence. Fire, perhaps, decoupling soul from body, was the surest path. But Fanon had not invented the concept. Pope Urban II had taught when he called for the Crusaders to come forth in 1095, that salvation could be achieved through violence. But history, as taught, as received knowledge, becomes a mythological discourse in which the powerful interpret the world and the weak are expected to swallow hard. That peculiar history is predicated on the suppression of other voices. How do people enter history when they've been around the entire time? At the base of Haitian and most all Caribbean societal development was a plantation system in which a highly efficient, factory-like economic exploitation of human and natural resources that led to widespread and unscheduled cultural and social transformations. This was privatization with always a helping hand from the government, a contradiction in itself. Colonialism, slavery, and the capitalism were the witches that presided over the birth of the twins, the Haitian state and the Haitian national culture. With such godfathers, Haiti begged for trouble. The response of the colonized was, of course, predictable. There were many actors and there were some options. Leaving aside the wishes of the classes of whites in Saint-Domingue, there were two very broad options housed in antagonistic classes, that of the gens de couleur or affranchi, and that of enslaved people, mostly black but also brown. Broadly speaking, the first group desired or craved modernity as a nation state and a status carbon copied on Western models, France, the United Kingdom, and the United States in that order. But while these views might be expected logically from Spanish-speaking criollo elites in Gran Colombia and in Mexico, the Haitian elites, elites desire shocked the white world. But the elite's position may well have reflected merely a desire to survive to emulate, springing from a sober assessment of what was possible at that time. The second group, that of a very large enslaved population of approximately 500,000 people, many still speaking various West and Central African languages, most born in Africa, might have opted for the kinds of solutions that seemed extant in the socio-political experiments of Palmares in Brazil, the Juca and the Saramanca, among others. The success of this scheme would have assured the death of the westernizers. Proto-African political entities could not ensure, probably, viability in the Americas, but could and did survive, altered within societies in a form in a form of marronage today's resistance i contend in the form of some form of traditionalist radicalism within 
semi-assimilated groups in the lower class is what one finds. These same kinds of political formations in Africa proper had not forestalled Western colonization of that continent. Yet, a national culture was, was in the offing in Haiti. In the late colonial period, all Haitians, white, brown, and black, were fluent in what later became known as Haitian Creole. Similar, though not identical, religious systems fueled by incoming saltwater Africans would collapse, collapse and coalesce to produce a Haitian voodoo, a real national religion. But Haitian culture was also based on three centuries of a common oppression, as well as cultural retentions from fresh Africans feeding the maws of the system. But class issues eclipsed a common culture. The Afroshi, some of whom had slaves and plantations of their own, brown-skinned and black, had had a different plan. After the assassination of the founding father, Dessalines, in 1806, the new objective was to turn Haiti toward the orthodoxy of Latin American political life, in which American-born whites had claimed power for themselves as heirs to metropolitan cultures, Iturbide, Bolivar, and Miranda before him, Santander, San, Ma San Martin, or Higgins had followed a similar course. These Latin American national heroes and founders had found themselves in the company of North American slave owners whose quest had been for mere political independence from Great Britain, not for genuine revolution. In Mexico, Hidalgo and Morelos had lost the war. In Haiti, Macandale and Buchmann had similarly failed. The spirit of Roger and Chavannes had prevailed. Transcontinentally, all the slave uprisings had been quelled. And that was the story, except for Haiti, and that was the story in Haiti until 1806. But what was the meaning of colonization, and how does it play out today? The banker and finance minister of France, Jacques Necker, asserted in 1789 that, quote, it is only by selling abroad the merchandise that it has gotten first from its colonies for 270 million that France obtains a positive trade balance of 70 million, end quote. Echoing Necker, Jean Chiffrin, Cardinal Maury, a member of the National Assembly, declared in 1791, if we were to lose each year more than 200 million pounds that you now get from your colonies to feed your manufacturers, to maintain your navy, to keep your agriculture going, to repay for your imports, to provide for your luxury goods, to advantageously balance your trade with Europe and Asia, then I'd say it clearly, the Kingdom of France would be irretrievably lost." End quote. The value of Haiti to France was that of India to England, of Indonesia to Holland, of the Congo to Belgium. The loss of Haiti would in fact preclude France from becoming a hegemonic power. The contemporary period understands the quest for power in similar terms. U.S. Ambassador George Kennan, cited by U.S. scholar Noam Chomsky, made the following argument. And this is Chomsky talking about Kennan. The third world's purpose was to fulfill its major function as a source of raw materials and a market for the industrial capitalist societies. It was to be exploited, in George Kennan's words, for the reconstruction of Europe and Japan. Kennan also suggested that Europe might get a psychological lift from the project of exploiting Africa. Naturally, no one suggested that Africa should exploit Europe for its reconstruction, perhaps also improving its state of mind." End quote. The value of colonies to the metropolis has always been understood well by metropolitan elites. The massive transfers of natural resources, human capital, and capital created in the colonized world to Europe were undoubtedly the most significant factors in the economic development of Western Europe. Haitian efforts to gain diplomatic recognition from the part of world powers proved difficult, none so difficult as with France. In 1825, 
The French king, Charles X, granted a form of non-diplomatic recognition based on the payment of 150 million francs by the slaves to their former owners for the loss of that property. A formal treaty in 1838, signed by King Louis-Philippe and President Jean-Pierre Boyer of Haiti, lowered the financial burden to 60 million francs. The final payment was made in 1922. Interestingly enough, the final payment to France occurred seven years after the start of U.S. colonization of Haiti that had started in 1915. The global implications of the Haitian Revolution and its aftermath held great significance for the world at large and for the Americas in particular. Haiti had gone almost seamlessly from colonialism into neo-colonialism. Haiti sought to help other revolutionary movements while denying it, but it did. Haiti would learn to distinguish between intervention and assistance. Besides, of course, the demonstrative effect that I had mentioned earlier, uh, the, the effect that the Haitian Revolution had upon the slave Africans in North America, the Caribbean, and South America, the American press and the American government was very clear in saying that we would allow no more Hades in the hemisphere. And this applied to Cuba in, in the first part of the, the latter part of the 19th century, first part of the 20th century. Leah Rhodes wrote that, quote, white historians in the United States have all but ignored the fact that Haitians fought on the side of the Americans against the British. She went on to state, that the Haitian Revolution is often minimized or deleted in American classrooms and textbooks, as if the horror is still too fresh and, not, and, and too fresh not to sting still. In 1816, the Haitian Republic sent approximately 1,500 of its citizens to South America with Simon Bolivar. Still in 1816, Haiti helped Mexican General Francisco Javier Mina in 1821, Haiti sent some volunteers and some weapons to comm Commander Payayotis in support of the cause of Greek resistance against Turkey. Later in 1830, ha Belgian revolutionaries received Haitian support. Both nations shared the motto, l'union fait la force, in union there is strength. The United States, in hindsight, had the right to be concerned. And such behavior from the part of Haiti would have had swift and severe military penalties today. But old-fashioned 19th century ostracism was immensely effective. The United States failed to recognize Haiti until 1862. And I will just add in closing that many Haitian slave owners fled to this country, to New Orleans, to Baltimore, to Philadelphia, to New York, to Washington, D.C., to Boston, to Charleston, and what is that other city down south? There's Charleston and there is, well, Savannah. Savannah. Uh, of course, they fled everywhere. They went back to France, they went to Trinidad, they went to Jamaica, they went especially to Cuba, uh, Oriente province, but they, they found solace in this land. I leave it here. Good morning. Um, I would like to thank the organizers for asking me to read this brilliant paper. I'm very honored to be doing that, and uh, especially since I am giving voice to the words and thoughts of this dear colleague, Patricia Penn Hilden, and I'm really sorry that she couldn't be here today, and I will do my best to um, honor her words and her ideas. This is a very important thing from a Native American perspective because uh, language is thought of as something that is thought about first in the mind with our intellectual thoughts and then it's processed through our spirit so that the proper words come out and that they're said in the proper way.
and then ultimately as the words are articulated they are sent through the atmosphere collecting all the goodness of the earth and then they come back to the person speaking so that there's this wonderful circle which we call die in terms of the power of language and it is with those thoughts that I begin this paper the title is Hunting North American Indians in Barbados by Patricia Penn Hilden, University of California, Berkeley. This is a story. It is an abbreviated story of a quest, one that is far from finished. It begins with my first meeting with the great Caribbean poet, Kamau Braithwaite, on a rainy night in Canterbury, England, where Braithwaite was giving the first of three T.S. Eliot lectures. That night I heard him sing and drum and chant the echoes of West Africa, sounds that he had found in Barbados, sounds he had heard as a child, but which he hadn't then recognized because of the opposing cacophony of Lil England, noise then prevalent in Bayesian identity formation, as I listened, I found myself thinking two things. First, that the indigenous sounds of North America were similarly muted and even silenced in our own version of Lil Englandism. And second, that something in what he was doing recalled an Indian amongst the African sound. At that time, I only wondered, though I began to talk to Kamau about this idea as the years passed and our friendship grew. Then I visited Kamau Braithwaite in Barbados and he took me to look for Indians, in this case the Arawaks, who had disappeared almost immediately after the first contact with Europeans, their diseases and their guns. We sought a site around a point at Biko. Braithwaite has written of this place in one of his brilliant poems, Barbasian poems. Now, final Bathsheba, but we must include the whole wild maroon coast from River Bay right round to Pico and the miracle of the cove, the ancient Amerindian religious settlement through Cattle Wash to Martins Bay and Congo Rock and Consets in the distance. We didn't find Pico that day, though I have been there since. It remains a sacred place, despite the predications of artifact-hungry archaeologists who have lifted as much as possible of the indigenous material history of the island and placed it inside the post-independence Barbados Museum, where it lies in a special room designated prehistory producing a heritage for contemporary Barbadians in a manner familiar in North America. But despite this assignment of Arawaks to a pre-European, pre-African past, I continued to find Indians in Barbados. I kept seeing Indian place names, hearing Indian sounds. I knew, of course, that Indian slaves had come from South America and from the Mexican coast, but I, still, but I knew also that many thousands of North American indigenous peoples had been captured and sold into slavery. In fact, near the end of the 17th century, the Wampanoag leader met a comet known to the English as King Philip had warned New England's tribal people. These people from the unknown world will cut down our groves, spoil our hunting and planting grounds, and drive us and our children from the graves of our parents and our council fires, and enslaven our women and children. I knew that tribal people had worked across the colonies, enslaved in households and workshops, on farms and fisheries. I knew too that Indian slaves worked side by side with African slaves, constituting one third of the slaves of the 18th century South Carolina. For example, moreover, a handful of historians Alan Lauber in 1930, followed by Caroline Foreman in 1943, and Jack Forbes in 1993, had argued that the trade in North American Indian slaves did not limit itself to the North American colonies or even to the trade between Europe and America.
So I began to wonder if some North American Indians had not formed part of the slave population in Barbados and thus possibly provided the sources for the place names Indian Pond, Indian Ground, Indian Corner that dot the Barbados landscape. My quest had begun. I started in the National Archives of Barbados looking for, rather randomly, through the 17th century records. I quickly discovered that all the myriad and hopeless efforts to regulate and control slave rebellion referred consistently, consistently to African and other slaves. But I knew that Indian slaves had been brought from Guyana and from Venezuela, so they could well have been the others referred to here. Then I came across the following act dated June 1676. Act to prohibit the bringing of Indian slaves to this island. This act is passed to prevent the bringing of Indian slaves and as well to send away and transport those already brought to this island from New England and the adjacent colonies being thought of people of too subtle, bloody, and dangerous inclination to be and remain here. So there I had it, clear evidence that North American Indian people had indeed worked in Barbados' sugar plantation world. I then took up Richard Hall's acts passed in the island of Barbados from 1643 to 1762. Here, too, were the tantalizing suggestions hidden in the language of more efforts to halt or prevent rebellion. I have time to read only a few. 27 October 1692, an act for the encouragement of all Negroes and other slaves who shall discover any conspiracy. The second one, an act for prohibiting the sale of rum or other strong liquor to any Negro or other slave. Then the third one, an act for the encouragement of such Negroes and other slaves that shall behave themselves courageously against the enemy in time of invasions, manumitted if two white men proved that they killed an enemy. An even more specific wording, on 6th of January, 1708, an act to prevent the vessels that trade here to and from Martinico or elsewhere from carrying off any Negro, Indian, or mulatto slaves. 11 November, 1731, act for amending an act entitled Act for the governing of Negroes and for providing a former ma proper maintenance and support for such Negroes, Indians, or mulattoes as hereafter shall be man manu manumitted for free to s or set free. Then a diversion. I encountered the only person who had written about Indian slavery in Barbados, Jerome Handler. In 1968, he had written about the the 1676 law, but knowing nothing of the history of North American Indian slavery, had reached different conclusions. Handler argued that North American natives formed only a minuscule and therefore insignificant number of Barbadian slaves. All the geographical references to Indians, he insisted, referred only to Caribs or Arawaks, or to Indians brought from South America or the other Caribbean islands. By the end of the first decades of the 18th century, Handler wrote, there are few traces of, more th of North American Indians existing as a distinctive subculture group. But traces, I knew, are more significant than Handler allowed. Stubbornly, I went on looking. There were words, and here are a few. At the beginning of the 18th century in South Carolina, peopled by Indians, Africans, and Europeans, where Charleston formed, where Charleston formed the heart of the bustling North American Caribbean slave trade, must tea meant people born of all three. In 1770, another word. A, in Scotland, a society of gentlemen offered this definition of mulatto. In their Encyclopedia Britannica, 
or a dictionary of arts and sciences. Mulato, a name given in the Indians to those who are begotten by a Negro man or on an Indian woman or an Indian man on a Negro woman. At the same time, North American colonial history was replete with Indians captured and sold into the slave trade. References often riddled with stereotypes born, as we shall see below, from the first moments of African Indian slavery. James Axtell, a noted scholar of the colonial era, offered a typical version of events. The English incited civil war between the tribes, then rewarded one side for producing Indian slaves who were then sold to the West Indies, often for more biddable black slaves. Axtell's absurd assertion that black slaves were more desirable because more tractable is repeated across the United States history. Here is Yashuri Kawashima writing of Pequot warriors captured after escaping the Pur Puritans. Genocidal attempt to exterminate their people in the 1630s. After capture, they were sold to the West Indies in exchange for more docile blacks who became the first Negro slaves of New England. There are others like these two purveying the same general area through the varying degrees of bigotry. How did this stereotype of willing black slaves and rebellious Indian slaves arise? Mason Wade offers a clue. The French at Biloxi and New Orleans attempted to use Indian slaves to work the tobacco plantations, but these ran away, and it was decided to import blacks from the French West Indies. Of course, Indians could run away, to their own tribes, to other Indians, to escaped black slaves in the, in the many maroon communities that soon grew up wherever there was African slavery. So long as they were home, Indians knew where they were much better than any European, as the records of Indian res rescues of witless Europeans attests. The other, rather than trading boatloads of rebellious Indians for cargoes of biddable Africans, it is surely more likely that the English in New England, Virginia, Barbados, and elsewhere rounded up and exported any leaders of forment or fomenters of rebellions, whether African or Indian. Removed from whatever place and community they knew, they were perhaps more easily subdued, more easily reduced to a slate of hope, hopeless exhaustion, characteristic of any dislocated, enslaved peoples. But it should be reiter reiterated here that the laws of Barbados Assembly testify eloquently to the constancy with which enslaved peoples continue to rebel to run. Still some more recent histories take a different view. Jill Lepore's In the Name of War, which narrates the Europeans' version of King Philip's War, takes note of the exchange of African and Indian slaves without characterizing either as tractable or biddable. Indeed, she links Nathaniel Saltonstall's continuation of the state of New England together with an account of the intended rebellion of the Negroes in the Barbados, published in London, London in 1676 to the simultaneous revolt of New England Indians. Terrified English colonists in Barbados believed that the Africans had intended to murder all the white peoples there just as panicked English colonists in New England feared that the Indians had arisen almost round the country. She concludes, the parallels between the two uprisings were uncanny and profoundly disquieting. Moreover, Governor Berkeley of Virginia complained in that same year that the New England Indian infection had spread. And Barbados' panicky governor Jonathan Adkins had sent a similar warning to London shortly before. 
the ships from New England still bringing advice of burning, killing, and destroying, daily done by the Indians, and the infections extend as far as Maryland and Virginia. So there is some hope for the overturning of this counter. Still, this stereotype, once spread through the colonies, continued for a long time to justify the importation of vast numbers of Africans to replace the disappearing Indians who were, of course, being sold for profit to the Caribbean. However scarce, Indian con Indians continued to be captured and sold to Barbados. Before the 1670 founding of Charlestown by, the, by Sir John Colton and his fellow Barbadians, Dozens more landless Barbadians flocked to the area where they quickly replicated Barbados' economic and social practices. Anthony McFarlane tells us, there was an ominous sign that Carolina would eventually follow Barbados' path in that the settlers took Indians as slaves, both for their own use and for the export to the West Indies. As commodities on the slave market, Indians were quite valuable. In neighboring Virginia in that era, a child was worth more than her weight in deerskins. A single adult slave was equal in value to the leather produced in two years of hunting. By the latter half of the 17th century, if not before, Joel Martin reports, slavery was big business in Virginia an important part of the English trading regime. Marketing the historical moments when the British sold captive Indians into the Caribbean slave trade is possible. Every single rebellion against the invaders, beginning with the first organized resistance to the Virginians at the beginning of the 17th century and continuing through the Pequot genocide in the 1630s and Medicom's rebellion 1676 to 76 I'm um, 75 to 76 produced Indian slaves for the Caribbean trade the slave trade was extensive there is room here for only a few examples. The Carolinians waged a long struggle with Spain in Florida the fruits of which were often captive Indians between 1702 and 1707, thousands of missionized Indians already trained into docility and servitude were sold to the Caribbean. The next year, Englishmen in the Carolinas seized between 10,000 and 12,000 more Christianized Indians and quickly dispatched them to slave islands in the West Indies. The Tuscaroras and the Yamases were also afflicted by these English colonial practices that both nations went to war to try to stop. Both paid a heavy price, though the Tuscaroras survived. When they inevitably lost their 1711 war, the entire surviving population managed to flee where they found refuge with the five nations of the powerful Iroquois con Confederacy, ultimately surviving as a sixth nation of the Confederation that continues today. The Yamases, some of whom were part of the missionized Indians captured earlier, waged a long war against this slave trade, a war that lasted from 1715 to 1728. They paid the ultimate price. Their defeat signaling the virtual disappearance of the Yamasee nation, though some survivors fled to other nations or, one, or to one of the hundreds of maroon communities across southeastern North America. A few years later, the defeat of the great Pan-Indian Rebellion of 1736 to 66, led by the famous war chief Pontiac, sent still more Indians on their way to Caribbean cane houses and cane fields. And from all the other invaded regions of North America came more rebellious slaves. All the years between these markers, 
all over North America, slave raids and violent conflict produced humans for sale. The plantation records of the Barbados Museum and Historical Society carry these few documentary fragments. In 1630, John Winthrop sold an Indian to Jane, John Man Mainford of Barbados. Two decades later, Richard Ligon visited the island and recorded this true and exact history, published upon his return to London in 1657. Ligon recorded many encounters with Indian slaves, many working in the houses of their hosts. One woman taught him how to make corn pone by, scare, by scarring it very fine and it will fall out as fine as the finest wheat flour in England. Indian men slaves made perino, a drink for their own drinking, made of cassave root which I told you is a strong poison. And in this case, they cause their old wives who have a small remainder of, of teeth to chaw and spit out into water. Ligon liked the Indians he met. He remarked, as for the Indians, we have but few, and those fetch, fetched from other countries, which we make slaves. The women who are better versed in ordering the cassavi and making bread than the Negroes, we employ for that purpose, as also for making moby. The men we use for footmen and killing of fish, which they are good at. With their own bows and arrows, they will go out and in a day's time kill as many fish as will serve a family of a dozen persons two or three days. They are very active men and apt to learn anything sooner than the Negroes. They are much craftier and subtler subtler than the Negroes, and in many nature falser, but in their bodies more active. Of course, generations of African diaspora scholars have demolished this kind of reading of the behavior of African slaves. Wiser than the Indians in not leaping to do the forbidding of owners and far subtler in keeping their attitudes to themselves. But that Ligon so admired these Indians suggest that the extent to which the Barbadian plantocracy shared these views and was anxious to accumulate many more people. Short, shortly after Ligon's return home, the Mar Barbados Museum records tell us a large number of Narragansetts from Connecticut were sold to Barbados. In 1668, at least one Indian slave was sent from Boston to the island, while in 1700, a big sale of Indians from North America to the West Indies occurred. A year later, in 1701, a Pisa, Indian captives were sold to Virginians into the Caribbean. The early 18th century saw no end to this trade though the bulk of the market may have begun to shift to the French-speaking Caribbean as the British continued their conquest westward as the French continued to leave the slave trade's profits to support their war efforts. In 1729, the Louisiana French, together with their Choctaw allies, put an end to constant Natchez Indian revolts, capturing the Natchez war leader, Great Sun plus some 480 others, and selling them all to the West Indies. The capture and sale of Natchez peoples to the islands continued until one historian notes bleakly, by 1742, the Natchez tribe had virtually disappeared. Small little markers, ephemeral traces, but signs nevertheless of the vast dislocation a terrible colonial trail of tears as later forced removals came to be known. Indians, slaves were useful. Indians, slaves were profitable. Indian slaves left behind land for the Europeans to steal. The quest continues, and there isn't time to narrate the further fragments I have found, but it is clear to me now that Indian voices muted mixed in the Negro, Indian, and mulatto slave worlds of the 17th and 18th century form an as yet little heard chorus.
Mixed into the complicated sounds of, of Barbados and Kamal Braithwaite has given the nation of the world has given that nation to the world. Even as I listen to Kamal sing, the drumming sounds of mile and a quarter that drizz that drizzly night in Canterbury, I really did hear too, the softer sounds, audibly nearby at Indian ground now a Seventh-day Adventist church. These, the sounds of the home front, the tonelli, music of the great Uncle Baba, the Ogun, and the sounds of prejudice, white man better than red man, better than black man. It was not a fantasy. Hearing Braithwaite, I was hearing our Indian sounds too. The drumming the sounds of moccasined feet dancing the earth. The extent of the trade in North American Indians and that I and others are beginning to document becomes clear each day as we foray into the archives. And increasingly, the question becomes, why the silence? I think there are two basic reasons. First, the overculture silence is easily explained by the fact that its historians never want to come to terms with a bloody and terrible past. The acknowledgement of African slavery by overcultural US historians took decades of struggle by African American scholars and activists. That the indigenous genocide behind all United States history has yet to be recognized is like the issue of Indian slavery. Due to the powerlessness of the indigenous peoples, and it must be said to their own reluctance, the trade in Indian slaves was profitable both to whites and to Indians. And in many cases the capture of slave uh, and capture and slave would never have reached the extent it did without the active participation of indigenous people themselves in a time when indigenous peoples were struggling to rewrite their own histories, tell their own stories, interpret their own literatures in their own indigenous ways. Research, not surprisingly, focuses less on the painful histories of collaboration and intertribal warfare and more on resistance and struggle. But the whole story, the entire past matters to all of us. And so this work must be done beyond the enriching of Native America's own history as well as that of the overculture. These are, there are other implications buried within that quest. Here too, Scholars of the African diaspora have given us a crucial lead and we must follow it. A few examples only, as Judith Carney has painstakingly recorded the African roots of southern rice production, so Indian scholars must add the Indian roots of that same agriculture. As Michael Gomez has shown, us with precise African origins of southern slaves, so we must try to track our own people as they disappeared into the vast maw of the West Indian slave trade. As Kamal Braithwaite has recorded the African cultural roots of Bayesian identity, so we must add the North American Indian contribution to the Bayesian world, as well as to the world across the Caribe, Caribbean. It is time, as I realize again, every time I am swamped by invitation to come to Jamaica, to the Dominican Republic, to Haiti, to Martinique and Guadeloupe, to Cuba and back to Barbados, whenever I speak of this work, women I meet tell me that their old grannies have always told the grandchildren that they were Indian as well as African. They want me to tell these ladies that this is so, and why before their grannies die? Others, Caribbean people now living in the United States, recount similar family stories, tales that always before seemed preposterous to many of their hearers. 
of tales that many argued linked people of African descent only to the Arawaks and Caribs, but never to North American Indians. But perhaps it is more than this. Perhaps it is indigenous scholars. It is just now, for us, at last time, in the words of Haitian scholar Michel Rolf Toulot, at some stage, for reasons that are themselves historical, often spurred by controversy, collectivities experience the need to impose a test of credibility on certain events and narratives because it matters to them whether these events are true or false, whether these stories are fact or fiction. Good morning. Uh, before I begin, I'd just like to thank again Dr. Daniels for inviting me today to discuss and share some of the results of my research and offer as a preface uh, a little bit of a disclosure in that uh, I attempted in my paper to discuss over three centuries of history in uh, Mexico in, I don't know, 15 pages or so. And it, that was a little bit daunting, and to try to do the same in 20 minutes I thought was a bit overly ambitious. So what I elected to do today is just discuss in somewhat broad terms the general contour of my paper and its um, argument, and try to tease out some of the more basic and more important themes. What I do in my paper, and listening to the last one in particular, it seems to me that what, I, what I'm attempting to do is perhaps the flip side of the coin, and that is to try to recapture, instead of the Indian past in Barbados, the African past in colonial Mexico. And it, it represents a certain similar problems, I, I think. And what I do to try to set up the problem in my introduction is use perhaps um, unfairly as a straw man, the prevalent um, popular myth in Mexico today that the nation is a mestizo nation. That is that the vast majority of its citizens are an amalgamation, a cultural and racial mixture of three very different roots. And those of course are the European, the indigenous, and the African. And in regard to the African, I argue that there is, there's been a lot of criticism, obviously, about this myth within the last decade or so. But in regard to the African past, it's generally argued that the mestizo myth in Mexico uh, provides us with a very selective memory of what that past looks like. African slaves are acknowledged to have lived in the colony, but are generally believed to not have been numerous, and that most lived in either tropical lowlands or coastal areas where sugar or cotton or other very highly profitable crops were grown. Or, on the other hand, um, slaves are often believed to have run away from these type of areas and formed their own maroon communities in some region that is beyond the pale of civilization. And what I suggest in my paper is that the lesson behind these, these beliefs is that Mexico's African past is generally considered to be minimum, to have been geographically limited, and inherently linked to slavery. And since at least the 1940s, starting with a few scholars and snowballing thereafter in the decades that followed, scholars and historians in particular have been interested in recapturing Mexico's African past and exploring the myriad social, cultural, and racial contributions of this very often marginalized third route. And not surprisingly, in the past this has usually been done through the study of the institution of slavery. 
And what my project attempts to do, and what I hope my paper title suggests, is look beyond the institution of slavery to examine the contribution of the multiracial freeborn descendants of Mexico's African slaves and how they uh, helped shape the colonial society that um, over three centuries of Spanish rule from 1521 to 1821. In particular, what I'm interested in is how these so-called Afro-Mestizos contributed to the reconstitution of Mexico's indigenous population. The way in which I did this was I essentially took a uh, regional, regionally based study. I looked at what scholars in very clinical and cold language call the mid balsas River Depression of Western Mexico and what today's inhabitants call very affectionately and much more simply the hotlands. This is a highland valley surrounded by mountains on most ends of semi-arid climate with some of the highest annual temperatures in all of Mexico. Although it's not too distant in terms of simple uh, miles or kilometers from either the populous central valleys where Mexico City is now located and which has always served as the political and economic center of the country, or the very important port of Acapulco along the Pacific coast, the region has nevertheless been always somewhat isolated and removed from the rest of the colony. This, of course, raises an important question. Why then select this region in, as opposed to any other to study this uh, relationship between Indians and Africans? In a nutshell, I would argue, it comes down to its somewhat unique demographic history. Prior to the arrival of Hernán Cortés and the Spanish conquistadors in 1519, the pre-contact indigenous population density in this region was relatively thin. This meant that uh, in the typical century after uh, contact was made with Europeans, which we see throughout the Americas with somewhere along the lines of a 90% population decline, uh, in the region that I studied, it left the countryside virtually empty of people. Indigenous polities that in 1519 uh, enjoyed uh, population of several thousand were either either vanished completely or were reduced to hamlets often of just a handful of families. Elsewhere in colonial Mexico this type of situation was often followed by the general displacement of the remaining indigenous population with Hispanic settlers often bringing with them thousands of African slaves to work in these sugar or cotton plantations as I mentioned earlier. However, the low regard in which the hotlands were held by the colonists and the lack of obvious and readily exploitable wealth in the region meant that this pattern did not occur in the, in the area I studied. Indian society, therefore, was gradually able to recover through both natural reproduction and what would I like to highlight today, the selective incorporation of outsiders, including Afro-Mestizos, into the fold of the community. And this process took place throughout the 17th century. Now, what my paper attempts to do as it, it looks at three centuries of Spanish colonial rule is just highlight three pivotal moments or uh, eras and, and try to show how inter-ethnic relations functioned in this region and, and the relationship with slavery. What I'd like to do today is just summarize each of these eras and pull out some of the key themes. The first era comprises essentially the, the first uh, two generations of after the fall of Tenochtitlan and the Aztec Empire, roughly from 1521 to 1550. And the story I tell in my paper is a somewhat familiar one for historians of colonial Mexico. And that is essentially the Spanish attempted to establish a colonial system for their own benefit based upon pre-existing indigenous practices. In the hotlands, two institutions were, prime, uh, were of principal import in this regard. The first was the imperial tribute system, and the second was slavery. Prior to the arrival of the Spanish, this region had been uh, 
a source of great conflict between the rival Aztec and Tarascan empires. And local villages that were caught in the middle of these imperial aspirations were responsible for providing various goods to these empires as tribute. Most importantly, this included cotton, but also uh, comprised precious metals and war captives. Local people also had to serve as soldiers and provide foodstuffs for the garrisons that were located along this very volatile frontier. Unfortunately, slavery is not very well understood in the pre-conquest era, but it is clear from early colonial records that the local elite owned slaves, and at least some of these individuals had been forced into, enslave, uh, into slavery as punishment for crimes. Most often, it's uh, cited as theft, as the crime on which they were being punished. Apparently, slaves were also held in absolute ownership since local memory in the 1580s recalled that the indigenous and elite were often buried with their slaves. Now, the Spanish, when they arrived in the area in the 1520s, were primarily interested in its gold and silver deposits, and they attempted to revamp both of these pre-conquest traditions, the tribute economies and slavery, to make mining enterprises profitable in an otherwise desolate and unappealing area. In regard to slavery, Spain at this time was expanding ever northward along uh, the so-called Chichimeca frontier. And this produced a number of battles and uprisings with the semi-nomadic indigenous tribes of the area, which were generically called Chichimecas by the Aztecs and others. The result of these wars meant the enslavement of what Spanish jurists legitimized as the captives of a just war, and hundreds of these individuals were brought to the hotlands to labor in the area's mines, and they became an important and, and I would argue, vital source of cheap labor. And just to give an example of how cheap they were and um, the very low value which, in which they were held, one Indian slave could be purchased in the 1520s for as little as three to four pesos, compared to an African slave's value of some 200, if not more, pesos. Spanish mining pursuits were further subsidized by a revamped tribute exchange network. Local peasant communities now, were now required to provide food, clothing, and shelter for these Indian Chichimeca slaves, and later on were also required to provide their own labor to help mine um, local deposits. But my paper argues, however, is that by the 1570s, this economic system had collapsed. And there's a various reasons for why this is so, but I, today I'd just like to highlight two. First, of course, was the toll of epidemic diseases. Peasant communities by the late 16th century were barely able to support themselves, let alone uh, generate a surplus which could be extracted by the Spanish. The second factor was the gradual enforcement of the Crown's abolition of Indian slavery in Mexico, most prominently mentioned in the new laws of 1542. The result is that local mines were simply not lucrative enough to operate with either wage labor or very expensive African slaves, as it develops elsewhere in the colony. This resulted ultimately in the collapse of the economy and the Spanish abandonment of the region. And this leads to the second era that I discuss in my paper, and this is from about 1650 to 1700. During this era, we begin to see the very tentative regrowth of the indigenous population after these series of epidemics had, um, had affected the local population. And to reiterate, African slaves were too expensive to, to be imported into this region, but if we were only to look at the institution of slavery, would, we would miss a very important dynamic, and that is the movement into the region of their freed descendants. Afro-mestizos were attracted to this otherwise very unappealing region, region for two principal reasons. First, beginning around 1675 or so, we begin to see a nascent livestock economy develop among a few ranches and Indian villages, which offered employment opportunities for freed Afro-mestizos. The second was availability of land. Just to give some raw numbers, in 1680, uh, re reportedly some 200 Afro-Mestizos lived in the area, representing 7.5% of the population. All but four of these individuals were free. 
Sixty years later, in 1740, some 1,800 Afro-Mestizos now were residing in the area, representing some 16% of the population. Again, the vast majority were free, and their numbers, both relative and absolute terms, continued to grow throughout the 18th century. But what I would argue in my paper is that their impact was even greater, because later census data masks profound changes in ethnic identity that had occurred in the late 17th century. Namely, Afro-Mestizos were attracted by ranching employment and available land, but many were also incorporated into local Indian communities. Villages that had tottered on the brink of extinction up through the 1680s often sought outsiders to maintain just the basic physical integrity of the community over the long term and to help meet collective financial obligations owed to the state and the Catholic Church. The result of this was that outsiders, including Afro-Mestizos and their descendants, became Indians, in a sense. It's thus clear why Indian communities might want to incorporate outsiders for their collective uh, survival, but the question still remains, why would Afro-Mestizos seek to change their own identity? And there's a, probably a number of factors that go into that, but today I'd just like to highlight one, which might be we call the legal legacy of slavery in colonial Mexico. And that is that Indians and, and free blacks were required to pay tribute to the crown in the colonial period. But only Indians were afforded certain privileges based on this tributary status. And these included very important um, factors indeed, including rights to village land, cheap access to the colonial courts, exemption from some taxes, and immunity from the religious persecution of the Spanish Inquisition, or actually the Mexican Inquisition. Blacks, on the other hand, like Indians, suffered from Spanish-imposed notions of cultural and racial inferiority, but enjoyed none of these benefits accorded to Indian communities under Spanish law. And I would argue this served as a very important stimulus, at least for some Afro-Mestizos, to adapt an Indian identity. And finally, in the minutes I have left, I'd like to just discuss very briefly this third era that I talk about in my paper, which is essentially the last six decades of colonial rule, stemming, uh, beginning in around 1750 and continuing through 1810. And historians of colonial Mexico have long identified these decades as a period of mounting crisis throughout the colony. And there are a number of reasons for why this is so, but for the purposes of today and for the region I studied, I'd just like to identify two in particular, and those are demographic and economic trends. And to put it as, as quickly as I can, essentially what we see is that the Indian population of the region is at this point able to reproduce and grow out of their own natural reproduction and no longer required outsiders to help constitute local communities. But in addition to that, uh, we also see a resurgent economy, first based on livestock pursuits, and then later a revitalization of local mining, which increased the amount of migrants coming into the area. And this produced a number of different clashes. One result of all these clashes and, and tensions over very scarce economic resources was a shift in local sentiment regarding the crossing of ethnic boundaries and what it might mean to be Indian. And this can be seen in a number of different ways, and I highlight a few in my paper. But just to mention two at the moment, I would suggest that there's first a, a marked increase in village political factionalism in these peasant communities. In other words, local uh, village notables were vying for political power in order to gain access to key economic resources. And one way to attack one's enemy was to assert that they were less than pure Indians. And not surprisingly, their enemies were often labeled as mulatos. This, no doubt, this assertion was a matter of fact for many village notables, given the way in which Indian society was reconstituted during the 17th century. But what I argue is that this fact only became relevant during the late colonial period. 
On the side of the Afromestizos, this is also a period of great stress. It becomes increasingly difficult, particularly for newcomers attracted to the resurgent economy, to negotiate the world of Spanish ranchers and miners, the, the colonial elite, and Indian villagers. Opportunities that had once been available in the Indian world vanished almost completely with the demographic pressures and increasing xenophobia. And in my paper, I cite uh, what can only be termed as an instance of ethnic cleansing as uh, the most dramatic evidence for these tensions, in which a uh, migrant community made up of both Afro-Mestizos and Indians, called Cacalotepeque, was over the course of two days destroyed by 300 Indian men, women, and children from a nearby village. And from the, looking at the surviving records that state officials produced to investigate this violence, it's clear that both sides saw this as a racial war. And to conclude, I just suggest that there's at least three lessons in the destruction of Cacalotepeque that might be worth mentioning. The first is that it's obvious in the destruction of this community that the state and the colonial legal system was simply unwilling or unable to offer much protection to the members of this community. Cacalotapeque was not recognized as an official Indian village and thus could not claim the rights and privileges such a corporate existence entailed. Secondly, the raising of Cacalotapeque highlights the degree to which ethnic identity and local history were refashioned during the colonial period and I would argue up until the modern era. Cacalotapeque was destroyed because it was seen by Indians as a community of ethnic outsiders, although the not so distant ancestors of these Indians had once relied upon the incorporation of such outsiders to ensure collective survival. This point, of course, was conveniently forgotten in its two days of its destruction. Finally, this collective amnesia also relates to what scholars call the disappearance of Mexico's African past. Released from the bonds of slavery, Mexico's freed Afro-Mestizo population faced a series of difficult obstacles. Like Indians, Afro-Mestizos faced the stigma of perceived racial and cultural inferiority that informed colonial law. This subjected status, however, was not compensated with any privileges similar to those offered by the colonial state in its hopes to co-opt the indigenous population. Many Afro-Mestizos responded to this situation, especially during the 17th century, by attempting to integrate either into the Hispanic world or, as I argued here, into the Indian world, a strategy that met with only partial success. Thank you. Good morning and thank you very much. Um, it's a formidable challenge to try to think about uh, three such excellent papers and to come up with a framework uh, within which to reflect upon them. First, let me thank you, the organizers, for the kind invitation to come up to Santa Barbara, beautiful Santa Barbara. It's always uh, very seductive to be offered an opportunity to come up the coast from Los Angeles. So thank you very much. Um, I'd like to entitle my remarks here this morning, Beyond History. And I say so because I think that history, as we have come to know it, is built upon a model of memory. If there is a theme running through all of the papers we have heard this morning, it is that there has been a failure of memory. There has been amnesia. There has been forgetting. There has been hiddenness. So what kind of history then are we confronted with when memory 
is at such a discount. I suggest that what we are dealing with, what we are engaged in, is a practice of counter-memoring. And that the name for this counter-memory is genealogy. That slavery has not so much a history, but it has a genealogy. A genealogy that makes of it something integral. And so perhaps the title of the session this morning, Slavery and Freedom in the Caribbean and Latin America, refers not so much to a set of culture areas outside of the United States. That is, the Caribbean and Latin America are not so much cultural spheres as they are part of an integralness of slavery, both in the area of the United States, the Caribbean, and Central and South America, within themselves, but at a hemispheric level, slavery was always, always an international system. Now, I'd like to offer a few critical remarks, cautionary remarks, um, and share these with you. Because clearly the backdrop of this gathering, the legacy of slavery on equal exchange, is the whole debate about slave reparations. The first critical uh, reflection I want is to offer the question, what does a reparative framework do for history? That is, when historians are called upon to apply their craft, apply their historical knowledge, what does a reparative approach entail? I'd like to suggest that it entails some positive things and some not so positive things. On the positive side, the reparative framework suggests that you have to deal with slavery as an integral system. It also suggests that it emphasizes the institutional aspects of slavery. There is no randomness here. But if that is the positive, that is the heightened emphasis upon the institutional and the integral nature of slavery, on the other side of the ledger, what you have is an approach that de-emphasizes the autonomy of the slave population and that elides the agency of the slave. So that, for example, in the papers we have heard this morning, we don't hear the voices of the slave. We don't hear about the agency of the slave, except insofar as it's a lamentation for recovering those voices. In other words, when historians are called upon to intervene in this discourse, we need to be aware of the pitfalls that this intervention might entail. And I would like to suggest that to the degree that the reparative marginalizes the voice of the slave, the agency and the autonomy of the slave, it will put back the historiography of slavery 
by a generation. In other words, we have worked very hard to overcome this silence. It would be ironic if in pursuit of the discourse of reparations, we find ourselves taking several steps back in the, in the history of slavery. Therefore, I would like to suggest that there is a tension in the reparative approach to slavery and that we need to be aware of this tension. But there's also a second tension that I'd like to highlight. Before describing that second tension, I'd like to suggest that the integral imperial system that integrates the discourse of slavery with the history of the Americas suggests that in comparative terms, whereas in Mexico, there is a national mythology of a mestizo nation. The absence of a national mythology of the United States of being a mestizo nation is precisely what precluded the American, the United States conversation with the people of IET. Would that the United States had a mestizo national mythology? Think of what this would do to the United States if it could simply acknowledge that we are all colored <laughs> and abandon this poisonous pursuit of racial purity. Think of what we'd be able to do and accomplish. Now, whereas in Mexico the national mythology of metisaje or mestizo Mexico drowns the components the ethnic components of that experience. In the United States, it might open up a freer kind of discourse of ethnicity and not simply drown America in a bland notion of some kind of beyond race, beyond ethnicity. Now here is the, the real problem as I see it. On the one hand, America, i.e. the United States, lacks a discourse of hybridity, metisaje, but it overcompensates because it does have this extraordinary discourse of liberty. And therefore, what I would emphasize in that poignant evocation of James Baldwin that we heard from Patrick Dante Bellegarde Smith's first paper, God gave Noah the rainbow sign no more water, the fire next time. You see, it's the rainbow sign that I think I'd like to focus on. Because without that rainbow sign, there could be no discourse of reparation. There could be no discourse of redemption. That it is the availability of the rainbow sign that it is precisely the availability 
of the language of the rainbow sign that allows for a language of legacy, a language of unequal exchange, a language of equity. America, in other words, is trapped on the one hand by refusing to give up its national ideology of racial despotism, but nonetheless gives to the enslaved this language of the rainbow sign. In a sense, therefore, America's, the United States, dilemma is that it arms the oppressed with the semantic weapons that will give this nation no peace. No peace. Now, the second critical reflection, and this is what I'd like to end with, it's my first opportunity ever to offer and to share a certain disquiet with the discourse of reparation. Recently, I've tried to acquaint myself with the debate about reparation or reparations, and it seems to come down to the question of who inherits the claim, the inheritability of the claim. I think that's bogus, because today we have a situation in Palestine where there's no question about who are the dispossessed. They're everywhere. There's no trouble finding the addresses of the dispossessed. And therefore, there's no question about who has inherited the claim to compensation. And yet, there's little movement towards compensation. So the fact that the United States might not be able to assign a claim is not the issue. Okay? Today, in Germany, the emphasis in terms of Germany as a national experience, the question of providing compensation for the slave workers or the descendants of the Holocaust is done as a matter of course. The deeper question in Germany is what are Germans themselves doing to come to terms with what produced this disaster for humanity, all humanity? But that's not what we hear in the United States. What we hear is, how shall we find the inheritors of the claim? In other words, what I want to suggest to you is that historians are not really the best guides to this, to this dilemma. That's why I entitle my remarks, Beyond History. You see, I am not looking, nor do I think the descendants of the African peoples, I don't think that we're looking for compensation. That's not the problem. It is the other side of the equation that's the problem. Namely, some reparative gesture is more important to 
white America than it is to me. So long as America is locked up and shut up in its delusion of whiteness, merely compensating this generation would be in bad faith. In other words, if you have a situation where someone has abused another party in a relationship of dominance and unequal power, the process of repairing that relationship is as important to the victimizer as it is to the victim. But America, the United States, is somehow considered to be morally above this. And so we have a, an argument about who will fund, who will pay to whom. I want to emphasize that's not the question, and historians can't help you with that. That what we need are some doctors of the psyche and the spirit to help America understand that to take this step would release it from a kind of bankruptcy, from a kind of inhuman narcissism, and that therefore it is not for America to give me, it is for we to give America the chance to free itself. Thank you. I want to give my appreciation to the panelists for some ver a very stimulating and provocative start to, uh, to, the, to the conference. And I know from this last part that there are questions. <laughs> and so uh, I'm opening up the floor to questions for any of the panelists. Questions, comments? Yes. Uh, this is uh, two questions for um, Professor Hill. and. Um, it's not to slight all of the very fascinating earlier talks. Uh, his summary, though, raised some very interesting questions. First, um, I worked for Dr. King in the South in 1965 and was his college coordinator out here for three years. There was 400 students, three from this campus, 20 from UCLA, others from around this system that went down there. With that background, is, the, is there a calculus of when is parity of the sins of the fathers, i.e. the generations of slavery, although my family was not in this country at the time, when does the, and these are the arguments that you hear, the sacrifices of the Civil War, the Civil Rights Movement, affirmative action, do they count at all? How much? How long before they, they are in, in that equation? Secondly, you brought in the issue of Palestine. Why is that dispossession of people so much more important than the Armenians, the, the, you know, and the Turks, and the other dispossessions all through history, including the Native Americans here uh, through the Catholic Church? Um, uh, you know, either they converted or they were killed in, in our state right here. So why is the Palestine issue the only one that history is supposed to be turned back to and, and, and people are supposed to get things back. The century is filled with people losing their lands in wars, and there was a war in 1948 when those people lost their land. Well, that's, uh, that's a lot. I don't know that I could readily respond, except to say that my referencing the situation of the Palestinian was purely to illustrate the point that the question of locating the inheritor of the claim or the claimancy uh, question is 
is, is really not a big issue. There you can find ample claimants. And to say that you wouldn't know who to give um, reparation to in the case of the United States, I think is, is, a, is a red herring. Um, but in terms of the earlier part of your question about affirmative action, I guess you could say the war and poverty, are those not, do those not, things not qualify? Um, do not those things qualify as a form of reparation? What's that? Yes, yes, yes. Um, if they are, they're of the wrong kind. Um, that is, to consider, to consider that kind of response doesn't help America, doesn't help the people who really need the help. The people who really need the help are not the poor, though heaven knows they could do with some money. Um, the people who need the real help are the people who have this assumption that this nation is, th th this nation is a finished, resolved project. And it is they who need the reparation. That is, it's they who need to reopen the issue about their relationship with the nation. Yes. I just wanted to briefly respond to that, that comment as somebody who um, maybe supports a more traditional reparations framework. That I, I, the way I see affirm, you know, affirmative action in the civil rights movement as attempts to address um, things that happened after slavery in terms of Jim Crow and legalized discrimination. Um, it, nothing, nothing has addressed the issue of slavery in this country or how slavery has built this, this country. So um, I think the, the, to, to say that affirmative action um, and civil rights is a response to or a reparation for slavery, I think is just bogus. Um, but um, I do, I, I, you know, I, I do under, appreciate the, the, the issues of reparations and the, the you know, the complications. And, um, but I had a question actually for one of the panelists. Um, you were reading um, Patricia Penn Hilden's paper. And um, I, I was really moved by it, and, and I, I was wondering how, uh, when teaching a, you know, a U.S. history survey course, for example, um, you know, U.S. history to 1877, um, what kind of works or ways to approach um, to make Indian resistance more visible instead of this sort of the traditional line that we get that Europeans came and everybody died because of smallpox and a few massacres here and there and except for the Iroquois League um, that's basically the story um, do you have any works that, that you would recommend or to help intervene in that historiography I do have some things that I could refer you to but also I think there is a lot of movement going on uh, with Native American scholars <clears throat> and often in relationship to other ethnic scholars um, about how, um, and I think it was pretty clear in terms of what my colleagues were saying up here about how do we study something as uh, profoundly moving as slavery. And I think the problem that we've had, and this is my own personal opinion, it doesn't have to do with Patricia Hilden's paper, but uh, the way that the disciplines are organized in the Western tradition limits our ability to understand the indigenous mind of the Western Hemisphere. They did not compartmentalize knowledge the way we do, the way we have to do it in universities. That is, you've got the history over here, the religion over there, the language over there, and they're all separate, and the two are not, the, they're not supposed to mix. And that is contrary to the way that indigenous people think. So until we uh, begin to push for
what I would call an integrated theory to this kind of work, uh, we're going to be stuck in that same dilemma. And I think that these papers were an example of that today. You can't just look at the institution of slavery. You have to look and see what was going on in the church, what was the government's agenda, what, who were all of these different people that we're talking about, um, and how do we take an integrated approach where we recognize that all of these things have to be looked at together in order to get at what was going on with indigenous people in the Western Hemisphere. So there are some books that have been written by Native American scholars and by African American scholars as well. And the theories that are coming out of this new work uh, are fascinating. I'm thinking of uh, Professor Charles Long's work on the diaspora. I'm thinking of Jack Forbes' work uh, in, in Mexico and with Native American people. I'm thinking about uh, the work that uh, other scholars are doing where they're focusing on a particular people and all the implications of the historical continuity for these groups of people. So yes, I do have a lot of references I could give you in terms of what are the, the good books to read, uh, but the problem exists uh, in our institutions. And I think until we restructure institutions, we're going to have this, this problem continually. Because if you're going to study history, I see this all the time with young people, they're very excited about history, and then they realize that you have to really narrow it down, and only this is what you can look at. And for us, who are people of color in this, in this hemisphere, we need to look at other things, just that, not just that, certain years, and that's it for history. So I'm constantly pushing for what I call an integrated theory, which means you have to look at the whole picture and not just one discipline. Let me, let me uh, uh, Patrick Belgard-Smith wants to make a comment, so let me let him make a, uh, an observation. Yes, I would think that one way of starting what you are suggesting <clears throat> is by looking at political economy rather than economics right. and politics as if they were not connected in any way, shape, or form. We may start there, and I'm hoping that later on we might hear from psychologists, and perhaps psychologists have been included in this, I don't know. Uh, this would be a help. I like the approach of Bobby Hill very, very much. It needs to be done. I'm concerned, however, that when we talk about whites owning up to what they have done, because that's precisely where it is. That is the question, and they've not done so. Uh, paying money is not going to help because they're not going to own up to anything. Uh, has happened in other places to a certain extent with disastrous results. I'm thinking about the national ideology in Mexico with mestizaje. I'm thinking about the mulatoness as a, as, as a national ideology in Brazil. It doesn't work. I'm thinking about the famous declaration of President Castro in 1975 when defending the, the Cuban intervention in Angola in, in southern Africa. He said, we are, after all, an Afro-Latin nation. As of January of this year, in all my conversations with all the Cuban historians that I know, in Cuba, when I asked, what are you doing in terms of the history of Africa, I had to repeat the question at least twice, if not three times. They do nothing. And when a friend of mine just put out a film on the Cuban uh, murder of 6,000 blacks in 1912 in Cuba, she is being blacklisted by the Cuban government and by white Cubans. They do not want to hear about it. There is no, very little mention of it in Cuban history books, and certainly Cuban students do not get access to it. The blacks who have had a chance to see that film, which is now out, have been stunned. They did not know that history. And the whites in Cuba are walking away. Okay. Can I just add one thing? Sure, go ahead. Uh, I think another thing that we really have to take a close look at is the, uh, the role of the church in all of this. Um, that's one of the reasons I'm in religious studies, is it just, it's fascinating, and I can never learn it all in my, in my lifetime, but the implications of the church in this political reality that we're talking about uh, have not been studied enough. Uh, they were hand in hand with all the other stuff that was going on. And this is a particularly difficult one because Christianity has been amongst us for so long 
uh, great grandmother, grandmother, and mother were all Christians. So how do we take that on? I know that when I start to talk about the role of the church in Mexico or among Native American people, uh, students are very uh, they're very apprehensive about wanting to learn about this. So the church, I think, is also doing a great job in keeping us in the, the mentality of a colonized subject. Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom after a while. And before I'd be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free.